Uh, this is another installment in our public lecture series in the library this year. It's our firm commitment here as an institution of higher education to engage the world around us with theological learning. What we do here at Princeton Seminary is training Christian leaders to think critically and faithfully about the church and the culture, about history and politics, to engage the world around us with theological lenses. And in many ways, this library is an embodiment of that commitment. It's a place of serious thinking and learning, and we want it to be a welcoming place of study and reflection and conversation for our whole community, a place where scholarship comes to life as we think about questions facing uh, the society and the world. So if you're visiting this evening, know that you are very welcome in this place, and we hope that you will return often. Our public lecture series this year has featured a conversation about film, about politics, about the environment, about the American religious landscape. And we hope that you'll mark your calendars now for our next event uh, when we will feature Dr. John Hammer, who is the president and CEO of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's the former deputy secretary of defense. And he will give a presentation on ISIS and religious extremism. His talk's entitled, Original Sin, Democracy, and the Struggle to Defeat ISIS. And that's happening on March 3rd at 5 PM. I believe that'll actually be happening uh, next door in uh, the Cooper Conference Room of the Erdman Center. We hope that you'll join us for that. Tonight, we are delighted and honored to welcome Elizabeth Dias. Elizabeth is a correspondent for Time Magazine, covering religion and politics. And we are very proud to call her a Princeton Seminary alumna. Elizabeth's work truly represents what it means to bring theological understanding to bear on politics, history, and culture. Her reporting demonstrates that religion is not a minor feature of public life to be relegated to the back pages of a magazine. But on the contrary, Elizabeth's work often appears on the cover of Time magazine. Her cover stories include Time's 2013 Person of the Year, Pope Francis. And her other cover stories have included uh, a feature on the acclaimed preacher Barbara Brown Taylor. She did a story about the growing Hispanic evangelical communities, which is entitled The Latino Reformation. And another story about exploring race relations in the US after the Trayvon Martin uh, case. She's recently edited a book entitled, What Did Jesus Ask?, which includes contributions from more than 70 leading spiritual writers, religious thinkers, and artists, including uh, some of our own faculty here at Princeton Seminary, including Dr. Ellen Cherry and Dr. Yolanda Pierce. And we have that book. It will be available for sale uh, in the lobby. And Elizabeth will be glad to sign copies uh, after the lecture this evening. Elizabeth joined Time as a reporter in the Washington Bureau officially in 2011 and was named a correspondent in 2014. That same year, the Religious News Writers Association named her as the Religious Feature Writer of the Year. She distinguished herself at time from the very beginning. She first did an internship there in 2009 while she was a student at Princeton Seminary. In fact, her very first published story for time was entitled Top 10 Surprising Facts About the World's Oldest Bible. It was a story about Codex Sinaiticus. That was her first story for time. <laughs> and that first story received two million hits on its first day of publication, uh, and was later picked up by CNN. So Elizabeth's engaging style and her perceptive analysis continues to gain a following, and we are so delighted that she is with us here tonight. Elizabeth, we are so proud to call you a Princeton alum. We are pleased that you are here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Dias. I don't know that I've ever blushed about Codex Sinaiticus before in my life <laughs> or thought about it in years. 
But thank you all so much for coming um, out in the freezing cold to be here. Uh, it's great to be back. And thank you for the very kind introduction. So just to, I'm curious as we get started, I know this is also a community event. So show of hands, how many people are connected to Princeton Seminary? Okay. So then who who's here from just the town or community? Yeah, nice. Okay, so it's a good mix. Great. It's current students. Oh, wow. Wow. Nice. Way to go. Okay, great. Thank you. So <clears throat> I thought uh, since I'm a journalist and what I do is tell stories for a living, I would share with you all tonight several stories uh, from my reporting recently that sort of really give shape to issues I'm looking at uh, in, as I think about the 2016 campaign, uh, which has really been going on since 2015. But, uh, you know, I, I will never understand why people say that religion and politics don't go together, because if there's anything that proves it, it would be this election, right, in every single way. So, uh, the, the first thing, I, I'd like to tell you about the first time that I remember seeing Donald Trump. I was in France. It was the summer. It was early July, and I was on vacation because Pope Francis was coming uh, to the U.S. In, the, in September, and I was just up to here, way, whatever is way beyond up to here. That's where I was in Vatican, everything, and I needed a break. So I told my editors... You know, here's a landline for the tiny hamlet in which I will be in Burgundy for a week. And you can call me on this landline if the Pope is assassinated. But if he dies, you're on your own. So, so uh, they said, fine, fine. So I had a blissful week. My cell phone actually broke the day I arrived. So I, I was like alone in a hamlet in France. It was amazing. So I get back to the airport at Charles de Gaulle. And, you know, sad that I'm about to, I'm feeling rested, wonderful, it's great. And I'm about to board my plane and I'm looking up at the television above the gate and it's Donald Trump. And I remember thinking, what happened this week while I was gone? <laughs> like, how did we go? How did I leave the country? And there was nothing about Donald Trump. And then suddenly it's like, Donald Trump is leading the polls. That was the headline. Donald Trump is leading the polls, you know, highest, receiving the highest percentage of votes right now. Um, and this was a week after he had made his first, well, in it was one of the, the first comments he made about um, immigrants from Mexico being rapists, what was the words? Uh, rapists, criminals, and drug addicts. I believe that's what he said. And I just had this like very stark moment of knowing exactly where I was. You, know, you don't think about where, where were you when you first remembered when Donald Trump appeared on the scene in the 2016 <laughs> election. But I was in the airport in Charles de Gaulle. And uh, I, I mean, I, I would encourage you to think back to where you were because it was a really important moment for – actually, no, I'm serious. It was a very important moment for how the narrative of American presidential politics was changing and has very real ties to – uh, religious identities. Uh, ironically, Donald Trump uh, professes to be the only Presbyterian in the race. That <laughs> God help us, though, you said. Uh, so that's that's interesting, uh, and it's just not at all what we would expect. You know, he's broken so far. He's broken every rule of politics, especially when it comes to religion. You know, there was a recent Pew poll. We journalists are always we always go towards Pew whenever there's a poll. Uh, and the, the most recent one, some of you may have seen that unlike anything we've seen before, uh, he, Donald Trump is viewed as the least religious candidate in the field. And yet more than half of evangelicals and more than half of Republicans think he would make a good or great president. And that just completely turns the tables in many ways on everything that we traditionally say we know about religion and politics. Ah, you know, and and that is a bigger story to me than things like he said two Corinthians instead of second Corinthians, and maybe he's going for the British, you know, the British pronunciation. If you're being really generous, but but no. So we have that narrative going on, and now just several days ago we had the New Hampshire primary, and for the first time ever in American history, a non-Christian candidate 
won a primary. That's huge, talking about Bernie Sanders. And I, the, the other twist that I love in this, a year and a half ago, I wrote, um, probably, I think it was my first story on Bernie Sanders. And the, I think the headline was, you know, the most, you know, who is the most Pope Francis-like candidate in the race? Or, or who, might, who might run because he hadn't declared yet? And it's Bernie. You know, Senator Sanders is quoting Pope Francis all the time on his social media, in his platform, but in a way that he, he actually means that when he's quoting the Pope, like he believes the ideas about economic inequality uh, and, and any of those principles, climate he's quoting a lot. And so you have a non-Christian candidate promoting the morals and politics of a Pope, which is in itself, I mean, when when we quoted the Pope before as like a positive on the left in American politics, it's always historically been connected to the right. So that's really interesting. And uh, I'm reminded of David Axelrod, one of Obama's uh, former main advisors, and he has described the race for the White House before as an MRI of the soul. And I've been thinking about that because uh, we're all, you know, it's, it's an MRI of individual candidates' souls, but this time around, it really feels like an MRI of the soul of the country and what it's saying, what all these different factions and unexpected turns are really saying about Americans and who we are in the direction that we're going. So that's just a bit of framing um, the when, when I started to think about what, what is even happening with religion and politics this time around. Those are some of the things... Um, big, big national, just off the bat things that I'm thinking about. Besides the fact that then eight years ago, uh, we had when when President now President Obama was running, there was no Twitter. I mean, that's a huge disruptive change in just how people communicate, uh, how we perceive information, share it, how we connect with national campaigns and and local campaigns. But uh, that's. It's, it's easy to forget how recent those really significant changes are uh, for us as a nation. So the, the one, let's talk first about one theme, the theme of evangelical, the, the evangelical vote, the myth of the evangelical vote. So I've spent the last three days, I'm coming here basically straight from spending three days with Franklin Graham. Evangelist Franklin Graham on his bus. Uh, I met up with them in South Carolina on Monday. And Franklin Graham, many of you may know, is doing a 50-state tour preempting the primaries in each state, sort of a get-out-the-vote tour, only uh, he's not promoting a specific candidate. So it's just get evangelical Christians to vote is his goal. And it's called the Decision America Tour. So I met up with them in Columbia, South Carolina, and then we drove, I drove with him on his bus to Georgia, to Atlanta, where they had another rally, and then went back to D.C. before coming up here. Now, uh, optic-wise, now, let me just preface this by saying I have not written this story yet, so you guys are getting like, the, I'm giving you the inside scoop. <laughs> on this. So you're, I'll, I'll sh I want to share some of my immediate processing of things that I'm mulling over as I'm preparing to write about Franklin Graham and, and his role uh, and what he represents for American evangelicalism in this election cycle. Uh, so he held the rally in Columbia at the State House in Columbia. And the thing that the State House is most known for recently is right right the confederate flag came down we had a uh, very inspirational and many have called it sort of a prophetic moment of the young woman who scaled scaled the pole the flagpole on her own and took that flag down and uh, I kept looking around when I was there. I was like, where was the where was the flagpole? But I was stuck in the sea of 7,100 was the official count of almost entirely, it was all white evangelicals, all. And there were several, it's a non-political event, but there were 
more signs for Ben Carson than there were for anybody else because people come and paraphernalia and it's sort of a theater. There was a guy at the very front dressed as a colonial person with a, with a, with a, I don't know, with the, the hat, the, the triangle hat. He, he was, he was, he was wearing a Ted Cruz paraphernalia. Um, and there was only one Donald Trump sign, very small, it was like a, a teenager was wearing a Trump button. But the, the, it felt so weird to be in this place that was so, dare I say, sacred for this other reason that was, it was so divided. I mean, it was just very clear. You know, if, I do magazine writing, so it's I try to look at big picture narrative and how these things fit together. And I was just so, it's very start, it was very startling, kind of disorienting to think about the very storied history, very recent history. I mean, this was not, this, is, this was still in the campaign cycle, right? Um, that this was happening. And it was, uh, everyone who was present was representing a very different kind of American ideal, and uh, which was not addressed at all, just wasn't addressed. So that's the kind of thing I, I note as I'm preparing to write my story. Uh, and then, so in, in Georgia, we went to Atlanta the next day. And the crowd was very similar, although there were, it was all Donald Trump signs. And hilariously, these women in fur coat, with like big southern blonde hair, and these big fur coats, because it's cold in Georgia, um, came, came and they had brought their own table with them. And they were setting up in Liberty Plaza, which is the in front of the Gold, Gold Dome State House there. They were setting up a table with Donald Trump signs. And Franklin Graham loves Donald Trump signs and whatever. And the police came and shut it down, <laughs> which was sort of, you know, a very interesting moment, just like the level of um, commitment that these women had to Trump and that they were connecting. I mean, they would I would presume, be part of the evangelical constituency that really supports him, right? That's, that's kind of churning up and giving uh, pause to people who have analyzed electoral politics for years, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, so then, then that was happening. And I would say the main narrative takeaways, I mean, Franklin, um, is giving the same sort of speech when he goes and it, it starts out there's a con time of public confession everyone wants to you know take hold of your neighbor's hand and confess out loud the sins of the country and then pray on your own and confess your own sins and then pray silently and confess the sins of your forefathers in which he clarified that his forefathers i.e. Billy um, he wasn't referring to Billy's sin he was talking about previous members of his family. And there, and in Georgia, he actually did mention the sin of racism, which I thought was interesting. And he mentioned that his relatives, his forefathers, farther beyond Billy, had owned slaves. So there was some recognition there. Um, but after they, they did that, then it was sort of a pause. There was a, uh, not an altar call, it was a well, I guess it was a modern altar call because it was done via text message. If you pray the prayer of salvation, you text this number, and then you get information back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know the number is five one triple five. If anyone wants to text and see what comes back. <laughs> um, and then after that, they uh, do a second time when when Franklin really talks about why is voting important. Like you need to vote. He says, I don't care who you vote for, just go vote. And I was trying to parse through because he uh, decided to not be a Republican, or he, he renounced the Republican Party just a couple of months ago, and now he's unaffiliated. So I was trying to sense, okay, well, where is he connecting? Where is he trying to move this base? Because he will reference lines like, um, 20 to 30 million evangelicals in the United States didn't vote last election, and you know, one of the fallouts from that is, you know, bad policies about marriage. Um, that he was really concerned about transgender rights with bathrooms, and so he says, if you all vote, those kinds of things won't happen anymore. And it's really important to vote 
on a local level, not just this national level. Like, make sure you're voting down the ticket. And if your pastor's in this audience, go run for office, right? We need you to run for office. And he clarified he's not going to run for office. But there's part of this mobilization effort, which is a very similar talking point to things that uh, we've been hearing from Senator Ted Cruz. And yet when I was on the bus with him, you know, I was just trying to flesh a lot of this out, trying to understand. And he mentioned Donald Trump four times, you know, just, just, just noting things, just like that's interesting what he's bringing up. And uh, it's, there's also this sort of sense of nostalgia of, you know, you think about Franklin and his father, Billy, and the role that Billy has played in all of the president's lives from his entire lifetime, I mean, the advisor to the presidents, and in a way that many have identified as, um, as, as opening of doors as possible most of the time, as opposed to the, the turn and sort of Franklin's visible strategy of this is the truth, I'm holding to it, and it's okay if it's very offensive. I mean, that's, that's just where the line is for him. And yet the crowd, there's these divisions in the crowd, right? Because being a journalist, you're trying to understand what are the motivations? Like, what is causing this, right? Where is this coming from? Um, because it's real and it's a mistake. I think, and I think the political establishment is starting to realize, oh my goodness, some of this, I, we might have been wrong, like, in just discounting this movement for so long because it's gaining traction. Uh, and the, you know, I, I noticed generational divisions. Divisions. Some of the young people in the crowds would tell me their concern. You know, they were they were more concerned about um, the America's future when it comes to race, whereas some of their parents and grandparents would would just sort of generally say we're really concerned this country is going down the moral tubes. Uh, so, I think. Those nuances and finding the pockets you know, are, is very important. Uh, and Franklin said to me later, you know, the, the term evangelical means nothing anymore. What does this even mean? He wants a new term. And that's not a new line uh, because evangelicalism always has sort of been, had its populist strains and sections. And, uh, but it's um, the, this, the splintering is something that is really important to keep, uh, for me to keep my eye on. And I'd encourage you to see, to kind of keep your finger on that pulse as you're going through this and approach to sort of, you know, what can we learn about what this is all saying about who we are as a people? Which the other, so, the, so theme two that I'm thinking about, which is pretty connected to theme one right now, um, Islam. It's very easy, I think, when people, well, I hear a lot of people ask me, what are the important uh, ways in which religion is going to be important and have an influence on this election? And often people are thinking about inside America itself, like just within our national boundaries. But the combination, as we've seen, you know, in the, the post-social media revolution um, and just the increased globalization of the world, uh, and the way that terrorism itself has changed in the last 15 years. I mean, 9-11 was 15 years ago. So there have been waves of change into how this is all understood um, happening. I think that one of the biggest question marks still in, when it comes to the religious influence in the 2016 cycle will be what happens beyond U.S. borders or things that have ha people perceive as having roots and people perceive as having religious roots outside the U.S. borders. So and we can see we can see this already, right? The the distinct foreign policy turn that all of the presidential um, talking points uh, they, they all they all turned on it, right? In in November and December after the Paris attacks, and after San Bernardino, and I've. I've been trying to really understand this. Um, this seems to me to be an election that's really about fear in a lot of ways. And for a while, I thought it was about power, but I think it's just really about fear. And 
that's a hard thing to report out in terms of facts, right? It's a hard thing to really put your finger on and and draw lines and say, you know, if you what are the influences that are is causing this um, reaction? It's 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 a, American politics have always been very emotive. It's not exactly <laughs> a linear, rational process in that way, but. I also think, you know, it's it's not surprising to me that this is happening, that this sentiment is all happening after eight years of America's first black president. And combined with the narrative of, um, you know, it, f- there's a lot of talk of, oh, it's so not politically correct to say this or that. And that's one of the things that a lot of the, the um, Republican populist types of supporters really do push to and point to. You know, they say, oh, we really love Trump or we really love Cruz because he just doesn't care about this political correctness. And one of the things historically that I've been kind of digging into is what happened um, when America elects its first black president. When did it become, it was suddenly, some people felt it was not okay to talk about his race, but then they turned to start attacking him as a secret Muslim. And it was sort of this trying to find a new way in. Right. And in Franklin, I mean, it was telling me that no one scooped me on my story, by the way, with all <laughs> stuff on Franklin. Uh, but he was and he has spoken very publicly about this, you know, how he thinks that President Obama's, as in his words, com- totally non-Christian upbringing. He came from a Muslim family, Muslim mother, Muslim father. And it was just such a present reality for him. And it was. Um, being in D.C., that's one of the reasons we reporters go on the road, because you got you have to meet people who are uh, shaping conversations and that people are listening to, you know, and what are they saying? And and um, it's a very present narrative, the Obama as a not-so-secret, secret Muslim. You know, he, and he said, you know, why, does, why is he going to the mosque? Because he visited, the first time President Obama went to a mosque in the United States was the day before he went to the National Prayer Breakfast. And I see that as that's very intentional. You know, that is saying to the prayer breakfast establishment Christian crowd, I am I care about the entirety of America's religious populations. And you could hear it in his speech. I don't know if anyone listened to the prayer breakfast speech. No one's everyone has better things to do than me. <laughs> uh, but in the speech, he said he went on this uh, very uh, sort of beautiful. Well, I won't editorialize it. He 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 spoke. It was one of the most sermon types of speeches that I've ever heard him give. And he talked about um, a uh, I think it was during during World War II. You know, and it was, it was a lineup of people who were about to be shot in concentration camps, and they weren't all Jews. I'm you're gonna have to correct me on the story, but the point was that. Um, the officer who was going to do the execution said, uh, you know, if you're, you know, he was calling someone's name and saying, you know, you're a Jew, step forward. And the guy behind him in line, who was not Jewish, stepped forward instead. And the Jewish man turned to him and said, what are you doing? And he said, you know, don't, don't say anything. And, um, and the idea, you know, you could hear in his voice, you know, we are all Jewish. He was he was refrain he was phrasing that line, and what he didn't say, even though as a pre, in the preacherly style, you could hear it in your own ear, was you know we're all Muslims, and there is such tension about that right now. It's just impossible to escape anywhere. Uh, so, <clears throat> and the the uh, other thing that I think about with that is how, and we're in a an educational setting right now. I've been thinking about you know, how has Islam been taught in America? How have uh, Americans understood, been formed, you know, as a people and understanding educationally uh, about Islam? And one of the things that I, when, as a journalist, you also get to just call up people and ask, like, well, you, I have this very pressing question. Explain this to me. And um, a professor was telling me, well, Islam, uh, unlike Christianity, Christianity is taught uh, as philosophical systems, theology for theology's sake. But Islam is almost always taught out of a history department or out of um, the context of empire building. 
And that's really interesting. You know, if, if, imagine if we taught Christianity just out of empire building. What kind of perceptions would people have? Then the fact that America's founding, uh, Islam actually, you know, we, we, when you go back to the roots of uh, <coughs> early colonial times, uh, Islam, <coughs> people had connections to Islam either through missionary work, which was often unsuccessful, through pirates, uh, because there was a lot of piracy and people taking over people's boats and then being captive, and then you have sort of a redemption, I tried to save you on your boat narrative of the, the one Christian person who was captive. <laughs> And then the third category was through slaves. There's, there were a lot of Muslim slaves. So again, we see this recurrent, like these are deep. This is deep in the American psyche and how um, we try to start to understand who we are. I just think that bigger context is really important to keep in mind. And then the third theme that I wanted to bring up before I take some questions. So think of your questions. Since I imagine you all have many, and I'm curious to hear what's on your mind when it comes to religion and this election. Pope Francis. So after, you know, I, I like to think of Pope Francis sort of as the anti-Trump in many ways. <laughs> uh, and we are in for what I think is kind of a treat this next week. So tomorrow, Pope Francis leaves Rome and travels to Mexico, and he'll be there for uh, through next Wednesday. Now, this is happening right between the New Hampshire and South Carolina primaries. One thing we have not been hearing a lot about in the talking points of candidates right now is immigration. Pope Francis on Wednesday will be in Juarez at the El Paso border, and he is going to celebrate mass at the border. It is going to be impossible for American politicians to ignore this. I mean, I, did anyone miss Pope Francis' visit to the United States? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, now, this time, I'll be curious because we're, I predict we are going to see big divides in the American population in terms of interest, right? I mean, we're between primaries, so that's happening. But all of the networks, all of the Spanish-speaking networks, they're going to be covering the Pope just like it was on every single network when the Pope was here in September. I don't think that you know the CNNs and Foxes and MSNBCs are going to devote that level of coverage. I mean, it was breaking coverage. You couldn't turn on any channel without seeing the Pope. I think it's going to be like that on Univision and Telemundo. And that is going to mean that the conversations that... Um, American Latino communities are having this coming week are going to be very different than many of their neighbors. I think that means something, and I'm really excited to pay attention to what's happening there. When Pope Francis visited, and he was, I don't know if any of you went down to Philadelphia, I, you know, probably it was a very wise decision. It was the craziest security I've ever seen in Philadelphia. Uh, they, uh, at Independence Hall, one of the sort of hallmark moments when I think I traveled with Pope Francis on his trip. One of the hallmark moments was being um, on the grass in front of Independence Hall, and Pope Francis spoke in Spanish about religious freedom. He gave 14 out of his 18 speeches in the United States in Spanish. And, I mean, it's his native language. Um, he made a very big effort to deliver the speech to Congress in English which was very important politically. I think that he, he did that. But to be on Independence, at Independence Hall where our Constitution and Declaration were signed and Pope Francis is there speaking about religious freedom in Spanish to a crowd, the crowd that came was almost entirely Latino. The, the energy was very different than at some of the other crowds in the United States. And it was impossible to not know in that moment that the future of the church in the United States, in this country, is Spanish speaking. It was just a turning point. It was just, I don't know how you can, you can look at that and not know that. And I, mean, I think there are plenty of people who are going to not pay attention to that, but it was defining. And this trip uh, to Mexico is 
it's 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 gonna be I'm really excited it's gonna be great I'm also excited because I don't have to be like stuck in the crowd and I can actually pay attention to what's happening on a different different level but and he's going back to Cuba I don't know if you all caught this but he's gonna stop on his way to Mexico in Cuba to meet with Patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox Church it's a very historic meeting um, and Raul Castro has played a big big role in bringing them together um the you might have heard you know a lot of people are saying oh this is a big 1000 year no one's met in 1000 years it's actually more like 600 years and then we'll have to ask the historians in the room to break down for us all of the different ways that the eastern church and orthodox communities have split and their different points of unity and reconnection with catholicism etc but it this is all making sense to me now because i in the news reports about the trip uh, the upcoming stop in Cuba, they mentioned, oh, this was planned in September. And I thought, now I finally understand why Pope Francis was spending so much time going out of his way at every point in the Cuba trip to connect with Raul Castro. And we would be, uh, we um, were in three different cities with him in Cuba, and Raul Castro was at every single one. And in mass, at each one, you know, the Pope Francis would come off of the, the altar area come down to greet Raul in the crowd. This was after, you know, meeting Fidel at his house and letting offic an official photo be taken. I mean, that, that doesn't sound like much in this age of, you know, cameras and everything. But let me tell you, that was a very strategic and planned moment for the Vatican. They don't do anything lightly. And uh, so now I understand, like, he's, Pope Francis is thinking strategically ahead. And even then, wow, how, how, what what would my connection and relationship with Raul Castro mean for possible ecumenical outcomes that I'm trying to achieve in the future? It's a real insight into, I mean, he's a chess master. He's a Jesuit. He's, he's thinking this through very clearly and carefully going forward. And I'm going to be curious to see how American politicians respond. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we get a little what does this mean for Putin and Russia? You know, is he being too cozy with Russia? I could, I could maybe hear that come up. Um, but we're seeing a reversal in American politics also when it comes to the Catholic community. I mean, there are more Catholic Republicans in the House of Representatives now than there are Catholic Democrats. The first time was this past Congress. And it means that traditionally, you know, we've seen alliances with the Catholic Republicans with the Pope on issues like abortion, mainly sanctity of life issues. And before Pope Francis came, I mean, the Catholic, the Democrats all across the board, you know, were just, you know, bowing down, hailing, this is, this is the best thing ever. Suddenly the Pope is championing all of their causes. And it meant that the traditional Catholic Republican establishment was like, we don't know what to do, you know, kind of freaking out. And uh, the U.S. ambassador to the Holy See said in last May, I heard him talk and he said he had just come back from a day of meetings, uh, you know, first at the White House when everyone was wanting to know, how can we get the Pope briefed on our policies on disability rights and climate change? And then he went over to the Hill uh, to Speaker Boehner's office and his staff was just freaking out, you know, is he going to wag the finger at Congress? What's going to happen? And uh, it's just, we're in a moment of all of these reversals and this big turning. And I think the religious narratives in that uh, clearly are, are unmistakable and very formative. Uh, and I can say that even though it's not just what I do for a living. It is just what I do for a living. But uh, I, I am, um, it's exciting. I find it really exciting. This is the... The opportunities for stories and for learning. I mean, it's a really instructive moments all around if we care to see them. So those are some of my inside stories and thoughts. Thank you for listening. And